Welcome to one more episode of machine learning. All right, please put your laptops away or close them. Okay, hope you had a great spring break. So a few things I want to go over. Um, so we had this survey and um, I was really interested in how can I, what should I change? Uh, was there anything obvious to change? So um, turns out it's a little tricky. Um, there were some concrete recommendations, but for most things actually, um, most things look pretty good. The biggest, co biggest complaint was actually vocarium. Um, I took all the vocarium feedback and sent it to vocarium. Some of it was pretty harsh, but I, you know, <laughs> I did not edit it. Um, but a lot of it actually got fixed. So, you know, we're working very hard. I mean, they are in particular very, very interested in making this work for us. So, uh, a lot of people always wrote like, vocarium was really terrible and now it's okay. And, um, and the majority of you actually won, would say we should use it again next year. So that's encouraging. Uh, in terms of most other things, it seems uh, reasonably okay. So the workload is okay. And there's a few people who basically say this is a lot of work, but there's, you know, and this is typical for, I guess, these questions. Uh, but yeah, what I'm looking for is, is it really lopsided, right? So in this case, basically, um, I have, you know, actually more people who say it's amongst the lowest amount of workload than there's people who say it's the highest amount of workload. Um, so I feel like, you know, obviously with 350 people, there's, I can't, you know, uh, satisfy everybody. Um, it seems the workload is roughly all right. Um, well, if I would change it, then I would basically upset one group or the other. Um, the most people actually claim they go to class all the time, which is surprising if that we have more people in the class than there's uh, seats in this room. Um, and there's many empty seats every time. <laughs> this is just a question to see if you're honest, actually. <laughs> um, and overall, I think uh, things seem pretty good. So a few things, uh, I guess here as you can see, the worst part is always vocarium, vocarium, vocarium. Uh, and uh, so, so I, I passed all that stuff on. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the material. Well, there's little I can do. Um, then what would people want to cover? Everybody wants to have deep learning. Um, so there, there will be deep learning. Don't, don't worry. There will be deep learning. Um, and examples. A few concrete things. There weren't, very, there weren't many things that I could really change immediately that I saw. Uh, one thing is post the grades on CMS uh, for the different projects. So we've done that right away. The other thing is make the homeworks more connected to the class we're trying to do this. Um, I guess the, there are some people grumbling about TA. Some TA is not being prepared, so I will talk to them about this. Um, and then other than that, uh, some people say the class is way too fast. But then there's also a lot of people who say the class is way too slow. So I, I don't know how to do that one. <coughs> um, Okay, and then I guess some of the math derivations are very dry. I'm trying really hard to make it entertaining. <laughs> I agree, I agree, it's dry. But there's not, you know, I don't really know how to, that's just the nature of mathematics. Um, one person said, like, none of the algorithms are really intelligent. I like that one. Um, computers are just not intelligent. <laughs> you know, actually, I'm not even sure if humans are intelligent. Um, so uh, it's just the way it is in some sense, you know, like the media sometimes makes it look like machine learning is, you know, is close to becoming conscious or something. Um, no, right? Like these are really just, you know, the way machine learning works is you have a training data set and then a the test set in some sense you try to see how similar is that to stuff that you've seen in the training set, right? And um, that's how all of these algorithms work. 
Um, okay, good. Um, but otherwise, most people seem reasonably content, so I'm, I'm glad about this. And thanks for participating in the feedback. Uh, one thing I want to go, I quickly want to look at the last project, actually, the last, second to last project, the ERM project, and look at the leaderboard. And maybe give those people who are leading a small chance to say what they did. So, number one is Storm in Paris. Storm in Paris, is that right? Where is Storm in Paris? Oh, okay, can you maybe give a brief explanation what you did to get such a high score? I guess actually the three with equivalent class, but yeah. Uh huh. You consider bigrams, right? Okay, stopper words. Okay, awesome. So, but basically, what they did is two things. Number one, they removed stop words. So, stop words are words like the and a and so on that could dominate your email, but really mean nothing about, don't tell you anything about the content. So, you can just take most common words that don't actually have any, you know, um, or don't contribute to the meaning of the sentence and uh, just remove them. Drop those features. That helps. It's called stop word removal. And the second thing they did is bigrams. So bigrams is basically you don't just look every word and see if it's in the, in the email, but you also look at two consecutive words, right? So for example, if you have um, Killian, you have Weinberger, then you also take, you say Killian, you say Weinberger, and you also say Killian Weinberger, right? Those two together as, as one. And um, of course, there's many more bigrams and there's unigrams. Unigrams are just singular words. Uh, but sometimes they can be very important because uh, you know, how you use words um, can be very predictive, you know, in, if it's spam or not spam. So th those are great, great methods to improve your spam filter. Um, how about the second team? DK. Where's DK? DK, what did you do? So I normalized the features. Ah, okay, right. Uh -huh. And then I removed the stop words. Ah, okay, same. Uh -huh. Yeah, and uh, that's what it is. And include the background. I see. Okay, okay, good. So I guess, like, you didn't do the normalization, did you? So I guess normalization didn't, didn't help much, I guess, in this case, but... <laughs> oh, interesting. Uh, maybe you had a different uh, stop word list. So he did the same things that uh, uh, the other team did, and he did one more thing. He took the vector at the end and normalized it. And so can anyone tell me why that may be a good idea to do? Like, normalizing basically is you divide every entry by the... You basically have word counts, right? You divide by the total number of words in the text document. Why is that a good idea? Well, you can tell us. <laughs> yeah, so the, uh, so the exponential was overflowing for me. The logistic regression exponential was overflowing if I didn't uh, normalize those Oh, I see. It was just a technical reason. OK, good. So you just did it because otherwise the code would crash. But uh, um, turns out it's a very good reason to do this. Um, and that's because you know, if you have a long email or a short email, right, that really you know, probably is not that indicative if it, it's one class or the other. So if you just divide by the number of words, then actually you know, your feature vector becomes invariant to the length of the email, right? Um, so it's not that, you know, it's probably not the case that longer emails are more likely to be spam or not spam or something, right? Uh, may, maybe it is, but uh, that's one rationale, you know, why you may want to do this. Certainly, for, for example, if you classify news articles, right, by, by category, if there's a sport article or a politics article, right, the length really is just dictated by the newspaper, how much space they have. So um, you would always divide by the total number of words because the length has nothing to do with the class of the, of the document. Uh, maybe the last one, depth. Where is the team? There's something else. I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> Someone can read it. <laughs> I hope it's nothing dirty. Okay. <laughs> um, can someone tell me what that, uh, that team and depth, are they here? I guess they are skipping lecture. All right, so maybe that's uh, um, <laughs> the next team. <laughs> All right, I don't, I don't know how to pronounce this one either. <laughs> can anyone tell me? Can anyone at least say what this team is called that I can call them out? <laughs> Who speaks the language? I don't even know what language. I guess it's Mandarin. <laughs> How about Steve Nash and Carl Sagan? <laughs> they are, you, you actually won last time, right? Like, so, yeah? Yeah, uh, 
Ah, interesting. Okay, I see. I see, I see, interesting. So I guess what they did is they basically picked special words that they thought was very predictive or certain symbols of spam versus not spam and then they actually hash them differently so that they don't collide with, with the other words. Um, and so give those words a little bit of an edge. Right? So that, that's certainly uh, very reasonable. Um, cool, very, very nice. The, um, one thing I guess that, so by the way, one thing I really like is that these methods that you guys discovered are actually the typical methods that spam filters use. So if you, for example, take your Gmail or Hotmail or whatever, spam filter, right, they use exactly these things. They remove stop words, they, um, you know, they use bigrams. One thing they even do is use, you know, uh, skipgrams. So skipgrams are actually, uh, you take any two words um, with, you know, a flexible number of words in between. So, and uh, so for example, you say, like the way you could encode it is word one and then star, 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 but star, star, star could be anything and then word two. And you basically, you know, whenever you see that pattern, you increase uh, a counter. And the reason that's very indicative to what's, that's good to capture spam is because spam emails are actually generated with templates. So the way um, spam emails work actually is, um, it's, I, I don't know. Well, let me just spend two minutes explaining you how spam works. Um, so the, uh, spammers, typically what they do is they infiltrate botnets. So there is, um, botnets are basically infected computers. Like people use, you know, download stuff on their computer. And so their computer gets infected. And then what the spot botnet does is basically, it, you know, it doesn't show the user ever that anything is wrong. What instead it does is it's a little program that basically communicates back to uh, the botnet owner, and the, bot, the, uh, the botnet owner can now use this computer to send out spam, right? To send out emails. And so the reason they do this is because they can't send out the spam from one particular message sender because then that IP address would get, would get locked up and uh, would be blocked. So they have to have many, many different IP addresses. They have many, many computers that send out these spam messages. The other thing they have to do is they have to make sure that the spam messages are all different. Right? So if you would send spam to Gmail, right? Gmail has so many email accounts that if you would send the exact same message a million times, right? Well, the, what all these email providers are doing, they're hashing e incoming emails and they realize, oh, there's the same email already got sent 100,000 times, so we just block it, right? And not only this, they then go retroactively through the email uh, accounts where it was delivered and remove them, right? So you basically wouldn't get through, right? So you can't send the same message, you know, too often. So what they do instead is they, send, uh, they create templates of, of emails where you basically say, here's the message I'm trying to convey, and in between you can basically randomly put in certain sentences. And they make sure there's millions and billions of possible configurations of these emails, so that no email is exactly the same. So that's the idea. So you know, somewhere you might basically want to put in sell Viagra cheap or something, right? But what you put in between is, can always be different, right? To regain strength or to, you know, whatever. Like all sorts of different, well, I'm not going to go there now, but you know. Um, the, the reason, by the way, I keep bringing up Viagra is because when I, I used to work on spam filtering and the biggest problem at the time was Viagra spam. So uh, it's not that I'm really interested in Viagra. So, uh, the, uh, the, uh, anyway, anyway, so that's basically, and the reason, reason um, because of these templates, basically, you have to have certain words always occur in the email and some random words in between. And so you can capture that with skip grants. Um, that's basically one way of finding signatures in emails. Um, all right, awesome. Any questions about this competition, the ERM competition and the spam filtering? Yeah? Uh, typically not. So they are stemming, for example, you take words and you basically go back to the root of the word instead of, you know, running, you just say run, you know. Um, usually this stuff only helps if you have little data. If you have enough data, then you see all versions of the word often enough and it does make a difference. So in some sense, nowadays that we have enough data, these methods go away. So that used to make a big difference when we had very little data, like 15 years ago. <clears throat> okay, good.
All right, long time ago, before spring break, we talked about kernels. And uh, in particular, in the last lecture, uh, what we talked about is how to define a, we talked about two different topics. One was how to define a kernel matrix that is well-defined and how to show that a kernel matrix is well-defined. And the second thing was how to kernelize an algorithm. <clears throat> so for the first one, basically, we had certain rules. So the one thing we said is, so let me just actually remind you, I know it's been a long time. And um, so what does a kernel do, right? So we basically, kernelization came from the fact that we had linear classifiers that we liked a lot, right? So linear classifier just says, h of x equals w transpose x plus b. That's a linear classifier. And those are great. We have very efficient algorithms like the SVM, that the perceptron, to learn these things. But um, they're also highly biased, right? They're high, you know, they have a very strong bias problem because they, are, you know, they can only learn linear decision boundaries, right? And so we talked about the bias variance trade-off. And if your data is not linearly separable, then these algorithms will never get it right, even if you have an unlimited amount of data. So how, how can we reduce the bias? And the, one way to reduce the bias is to extend, to map our x into a high dimensional feature vector. Right? So if you go into a very high dimensional space, then it turns out you know, your data is much more likely to be linearly separable. And so that seems like an effective thing to do. But on the other hand, the problem is now this is really, really high dimensional. And now you have a very large vector w. And so what we did then is we could show that for most of these algorithms, you know, the data is actually never really accessed as a vector itself. It's only ever accessed in terms of inner products. So all we need, if you're a little clever about choosing this phi of x, then we can actually define a kernel function such that um, this kernel function that just computes the inner product after the data is mapped into this high dimensional space very, very efficiently. Right? And so some examples that we had was the polynomial kernel that goes into an exponentially high dimensional space, but you never have to compute it. You just compute the, the kernel function, which is very fast to compute. Or the RBF kernel, radial basis function kernel, which just basically puts a Gaussian around every data point. Again, very, very s simple to compute. And the RBF kernel, in fact, corresponds to an infinite dimensional phi of x. <clears throat> uh, one question is, well, can we just come up with any such function k um, to define inner products? And, and the answer is no, right? It has to be a well-defined function in the sense that if you take any set of vectors, if you take any n vectors in a computer matrix K, such that capital K, ij equals K of xi, xj, this matrix here has to be positive semi-definite, right? So it has to give rise to a positive semi-definite matrix. And one thing we talked about is that basically, you know, I gave you eight rules how to take any kernel and kind of uh, modify that kernel. So once you have a kernel function, you can do modifications. You can apply modifications to that kernel function, and you still get a kernel, right? And so then you can start with the simplest possible kernel, which is the linear kernel. The linear kernel just says, that is x transpose z. <clears throat> That's a well-defined kernel. That's just the inner product matrix. And you start from here, and then you basically massage your, your kernel function around by multiplying, by exponentiating, and so on, until you actually eventually get to the kernel function you want. And one thing we did last lecture is that we showed that the exponential kernel, and we could prove in a few steps, just applying these rules, that starting from the linear kernel, we can basically arrive at the exponential kernel, and we maintain the positive semi-definiteness. So the exponential kernel is provably a well-defined kernel. <clears throat> All right, so that was the first thing um, we did last lecture. And then the second thing was, OK, now that we have such a kernel function, and so uh, you know, you're free to design your own for whatever application you have. So by the way, one thing I just want to emphasize is one thing that's very powerful about this kernel function is that these don't have to be vectors, right? So these can actually be, be defined kernels over sets, or it can define kernels over strings. That's, in fact, what you have to do in the homework. Um, and um, so once you have such a kernel function, how do you now uh, kernelize an algorithm? And so there's basically two steps. The first step is you show that your algorithm only accesses inputs in terms of inner products. And the second step is you swap in the inner products for the kernel function. 
right? And so you have to, to, when you show that everything is accessed in terms of inner products, you have to show this during training and during testing, right? So in both the inference time and during training time, you can only use inner products. Okay, and then I, I walked, last time we walked through one of the algorithms, um, and that was kernel regression. And let me just remind you, let me just quickly go through it one more time, because I will continue there today. Um, and that was basically the, the kernel regression is, oh, let me study you. So kernel regression is basically the kernelized version of linear regression. If you remember linear regression, minimizes the following loss function. Um, well, actually, let me do this. W transpose xi minus yi squared. Okay, so that's just the square loss. <clears throat> and if you have a, that's, we can solve this. If you do MLE, we get ordinary least squares. If you do MAP, then we get a uh, bridge regression, which basically has a regular right. And we can write this, and I'm just going to quickly, one more time, derive the kernel version because it's just a three-liner. Uh, if you want to, if you write this as a matrix, where well, this here is my matrix, x1, xn, and I have a vector y, y1 to yn. Just be careful, that's the other way around than in the, this is the transpose of the way Python or Julia store it. Um, then you can write this thing here as just minimize um, x, well, x transpose w minus y transpose squared. Any questions at this point? <clears throat> okay. And if I write out that square, well, that just becomes, um, oh, sorry. Let me actually do something else. Now, this is my W in there. In order to kernelize it, I have to get rid of this W. And so, the proof that we showed earlier is that W actually is a linear combination of my x's. And so, what we can write is W equals x times alpha, right? Which is basically saying I sum over all my alpha, xi times alpha i. Right? So, my W is just a linear combination of all my x's, and you have to show that that. If you do this, that you're not restricting the number of solutions. It turns out you don't, because it's just gradient descent, and this is the proof we showed a couple of lectures ago. <clears throat> so if you do this, if you plug that in for x, then actually this here becomes x transpose x alpha. So I just, for w, I plug in this term. And now you see x transpose x. What's x transpose x? There's a matrix. That's what, can anyone tell me something about this matrix? What's the ijth entry of this matrix? Yeah. It, it's symmetric. Good, good. It's symmetric. What else is it? Yeah. It's the covariance almost. It's the inner product matrix, right? So if I take x transpose x, x transpose x, ij equals xi transpose xj. Right, does that make sense? I take my x transpose is this, x1, xn, times x1, xn. Right, and so the, the first column of this matrix is the inner product of x1 with everything else, then x2 with everything else, and so on. So ij is xi in a product with xj, right? So what is this? That's exactly the kernel matrix, right? That's k. All right, but k is just the inner product matrix. Raise your hand if that makes sense. Okay, awesome, good. And now if you minimize this, well, actually, that becomes now pretty simple, right? We can just do... Um, Right on here, you know, if we just co complete the square, then we get alpha transpose k <coughs> transpose k alpha minus 2 <coughs> y k alpha plus y transpose y, I guess. Um, that's what we're trying to minimize. 
With respect to alpha, how do we do this? We take the derivative. With respect to alpha, derivative here becomes 2 times k, uh, well, k transpose is the same as, as you said, it's symmetric, um, minus, and then actually this becomes 2 ky transpose. So this here is, if I take the derivative with respect to alpha, this term here, there's a quadratic term, so that just becomes 2 times k, k times alpha. This is a linear term, something, some matrix times alpha, that becomes the matrix transpose. So this is just good old taking derivatives of vectors. And if you set that to 0, um, then I can move this term to the right. And so I get, now I divide by 2. Now I get kk alpha equals ky transpose. They're almost there. I multiply by k inverse. So I get rid of this thing. And I get k alpha equals y transpose. I multiply again by k inverse, and I get alpha equals k inverse y transpose. And that's the answer. So kernelized regression has a closed form solution, and it's just k inverse times y, or y transpose, depends on how you organize your y. Any questions? Yeah? Is there any way to interpret the results? Um, if you use kernelized regression, is there any way to interpret the results? Uh, well, what do you want to interpret? Uh, so I want to know which, uh, which features were important? Yes. Yeah, not really, right? That gets lost. Yeah. Depends. So, you know, well, if you use a linear kernel and this is identical to normal regression, then yes. Otherwise, no. Any more questions? Yeah? Yes, otherwise it's not an inner product. Right, so, so the kernel matrix, all it does, right, it, it defines an inner product. And if it's not positive and definite, it's not an inner product. It's an if and only if statement. Yeah. So otherwise it's just a random, you know, it's just not, it, it doesn't solve that anymore. Right? You're no longer learning about your function in a high dimensional space. Okay, any more questions? Yeah, last question. Very good question. Okay, good. So his question is, how do you actually do this on the test data? Is that your question? Okay, let me go there. Um, so now we have our alphas, right? Let's go back, take, take a step back. So what is, what is the linear classifier? Linear classifier actually is um, h of z, z is my test point, w transpose z, right? Now, we don't have w. Uh, we can't compute W. So what do we do? We know W, what W is. W is this guy here, right? X times alpha. So that's X times alpha transpose, alpha transpose X transpose Z. Right? <coughs> What's alpha? Alpha is this vector here. What's X transpose Z is exactly what you just said. It's the inner product of z, of the test point, with every single point in my training data. Okay? So what is that? That would make a kernel matrix with one more point, with a test point. That would be the slice of the kernel matrix that basically corresponds to that test point, right? So we can call this k star. Right? That's a vector in some sense, where the ith entry, k star i, is z transpose xi. Okay, it's the kernel, or if we do a kernelized version, that's the kernel function of z and xi. Right, that, that's what that is. <clears throat> and here comes the amazing thing. This here is again a linear classifier. Right? So we basically just get a, a vector alpha, which has n dimensions. And of course, we just transform our data into basically a long vector of n inner products. And now we are back where we started from with a linear classifier during test time. 
But instead of in D dimensions, we're actually in N dimensions. So one more time, we had our original data that was in D dimensions, right? We implicitly mapped it into some ridiculous high dimensional space. You know, x goes to phi of x. We do the whole learning in this ridiculously high dimensional space with millions or you know, infinitely many dimensions. What we get out is actually a classifier that operates in n dimensions. And that's actually not surprising. That makes perfect sense. Why is this? Because in this very high dimensional space, right, I told you W is a linear combination of my n training points. Well, n data points can only span an n-dimensional space, right? So we must lie in an n-dimensional subspace in this infinite dimensional space. And that's exactly what we capture here. So ultimately, for classification, we only need an n-dimensional space. <coughs> Raise your hand if that makes sense. OK, here's the question. Is kernel regression parametric, or is it not parametric? I'll give you a minute, discuss it with your neighbor. <clears throat> All right, so we have a vote. Who says it is parametric? Raise your hand. Who says it's non-parametric? Who has no idea what I'm talking about? All right. <laughs> um, so I guess there was a, there was a majority of non-parametric. There was a tie between no idea what I'm talking about and parametric, I guess. <clears throat> so. Let me just repeat one more, uh, remind you of what parametric versus non-parametric is. So a parametric algorithm is one that has a fixed size of parameters that you learn during training time, and then you apply during testing time. Right? So if you have more data, you don't learn more parameters. A non-parametric algorithm is where the model size grows as you get more training data. So an example was Kanier's neighbor classification. So the question is, is kernel regression parametric or non-parametric? <clears throat> and the majority of you say it's non-parametric. Why is it non-parametric? <clears throat> Who wants to say it? <laughs> Anyone wants to explain why it's non-parametric? Yeah? The number of parameters, the alphas, are n-dimensional. So if you have n training points, you have n parameters. So the number of parameters grows with the uh, data set size. That's correct. Why is it parametric? Who can explain why it's parametric? Yeah? Because you are learning parameters at the training time. Like at the alpha, we are learning it at the training time, but then use it for the training. That's OK. That's OK. But the question is, like, if you would train again with more data, would you have more parameters? So that, that would make it non-parametric. But it turns out it's also parametric. Why is it parametric? Yeah. Is it because the parameters involved in the kernel? No, it's because essentially what you're learning is still a W, right? 
you know, h of x is w transpose phi of x. And this is a finite number of parameters, right? This is basically in some, so if you did a polynomial kernel, this may be 10 billion dimensions, so you can at most have 10 billion parameters, and not more than that, right? Because that's actually, that describes your classifier fully. So it's somewhere in between. Right, certainly if you have an RBF kernel, then this representation wouldn't even make any sense, because this would be infinite dimensional. So you only can use the alpha representation, and that grows with the number of training sets. So it's clearly non-parametric, right? But if you actually have a kernel that gives rise to a not so high dimensional space, then you can also view it as parametric. Generally, it is considered a non-parametric algorithm because people typically use kernels that are extremely high, uh, high dimensional. Okay, any questions about this? <clears throat> All right, so now I want to go to the most famous kernelized algorithm. Um, <clears throat> And this is, in some sense, how the whole frenzy started with kernelization. So for 10 years, the entire field did nothing else but kernelize everything, right? Starting from their breakfast, right? <clears throat> and this was for the invention of SVM. So support vector machines became exceedingly popular because that was actually when kernelization came up. And so I'll just remind you of the optimization problem of SVMs. This is the SVM optimization problem. We minimize the norm of W and then, you know, and the um, uh, violation of our parameters that actually say that every data point has to be on the right side of the decision boundary by at least one. Um, now, it turns out you can actually go through this and you can find that um, this is, all, you know, everything is just accessed in terms of inner products. But actually, it turns out here's a very, very beautiful way of deriving um, a kernelized version. And that's actually, that's why people went crazy. Right? It's like, you know, people just saw this and it was so beautiful. They, they stopped doing everything else, right? They stopped attending their kids and loved ones and just, you know, in pursuit of this beauty. <clears throat> so, basically what this is, this is a quadratic program and it's convex. And um, so I used to, in former classes, when I used to teach this class, I always used to derive it, but it's, I think some people, you know, never really recovered from it. So I, I, I stopped doing it. But I'm just going to give you the high-level intuition. So uh, this is a convex problem. And so this here is my problem, you know, for every value of w, I get some function, you know, uh, some objective value. And I'm trying to find this minimum. This is my w star. This is the best possible w. And uh, this is a convex problem, it's a quadratic problem, so we, can, we know how to solve it. There's another thing we know about convex problems. If you know a little bit about optimization theory, then you know that this is a primal problem. And so every optimization problem that's convex has a dual problem. A dual problem is somehow like an alternate universe, right? Where everything is reversed. Where everything is upside down. It's like anti-Superman and Superman or something. I think, you know, that's like... So the dual problem is a maximization problem. So it's some other function, but we try to maximize a function. And these two problems, because they are, this one is convex, turns out they have exactly the same solution. Right? And this is something, this is a good old known thing from optimization theory. Right? This must be the case, it's always the case. Right? And this, the first thing you learn if you take a class in optimization theory is like, given such a problem, how do you derive the dual problem? Right? And it's like a standard ways of steps to get from the primal problem to the dual problem. The dual problem is now a maximization problem, but you try to maximize this. And the reason you may want to do this is because sometimes these dual problems can be quite different from the primal problem, and sometimes they can be easier to solve, right? Or there may be some properties that become possible um, or obvious to the dual problem. And uh, uh, another reason why people do this is that these primal dual algorithms, they solve the primal problem and the dual problem at the same time. They basically take a step in the primal problem, and then they take this, plug this into, convert it to the dual problem, and take a step here, and so on. And one thing they do is they always measure the gap between these two solutions. And they know when they're at the minimum, this gap must be zero. Right? So this way, it's a very, very effective way to see that you actually achieve the minimum. Right? This is what primal dual, it's like the primal dual gap, if that's down to zero. So when um, the inventor of the SVM came up with the primal problem, like this optimization problem, the first thing people did was like, well, what's the dual problem? Right? 
And so when they derived, when they wrote down the dual problem, and I'm just going to state it here, um, then actually what you see is that that actually clearly only accesses the data points in terms of inner products. And it basically does the following. You have n variables, alpha 1 to alpha n. And the, uh, the function is the following, a sum over i, j, alpha i, alpha j, y i, y j, k i, j, where k i, j is the inner product between i and j, minus the sum over all alphas, such that each alpha is greater or equal 0 and less equal c, and the sum over alpha i, y i equals 0. Right? And so here is when people saw that here, in, here basically had xi transpose xj, and they realized, wait a second, this only accesses the data points in terms of inner products. Right? It was inescapable. Right? It was so obvious. And so they plugged in these different inner products, and they suddenly realized we get much, much better results. Right? And so that's kind of where the whole kernelization came from. <clears throat> and so actually, by the way, the next project will be for you to implement the primal and the dual of an optimization problem. Um, <clears throat> and one thing you're going to notice is that uh, this, of course, doesn't, you know, doesn't contain W anymore. And so when people then solve for W, uh, and again, it's not very complicated to derive, but it requires a little bit of optimization theory. And so that's why I'm not doing it anymore, because it seems like a silly prerequisite for this class, you know, if you just need it for one lecture. Um, but if you solve for W, what you get is the following. W equals sum over I equals 1 to N alpha I Y I um, X I. <clears throat> so that's pretty much exactly what we had just now with kernel regression. The only thing is we also multiply by a sign. That doesn't really make any difference. <clears throat> so we multiply by the label. The label is plus 1 or minus 1. <clears throat> All right, and so solving this, this dual problem is just as complex as solving the primal problem. There's no difference. There are some algorithms that are particularly suited for, for the dual problem. But the beauty of this is, and this is actually what, what gets really, really interesting, is that this dual problem assigns basically these alpha i's. That's basically the weight we assign to every single uh, data point between 0 and c. And almost all of them are 0. Only those that actually are the support vectors, and that's why it's called support vectors, so only those points that actually uh, have here inequality or actually have non-zero psi, so only those points, if you look at the classifier, you know, here's basically my data set. And I have my, my, classif my, 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 my decision boundary here, and here, the second line here is this margin. Only those points that lie on the margin have non-zero alphas. <clears throat> what? <laughs> Um, <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> All right, and uh, if you now plug in this definition of W, H of X equals W transpose X plus B. W is just this thing here, so we just get i equals 1 to n alpha i y i k of x i, uh, let's, let's call this z, the test point, z plus b. One question is where does b come from? And uh, well, it actually, it actually turns out it's very easy to solve for because you know that basically, uh, you know that this equation here in, in the middle Basically, you know that this constraint here must be satisfied. Um, so if you actually plug in these equations, you can actually solve for B. So that's the idea. Um, have I written it on, uh, did I write it on the notes? Oh yeah, okay. So we know the following. If alpha i is greater or equal to 0, 
That's the case if and only if um, y i w transpose phi of x i uh, plus b equals 1. This here is basically a row of the kernel matrix. <coughs> this is basically k i, this is the ith column. And you can just solve this for b. And that's how you get b. <coughs> um, so I'm saying this because you have to do it in the, in the project. So actually, maybe I'll show you the project real quick and, and uh, give you a little overview. So the project will be pushed out very, very soon. It's already done. We're always testing it before and on some set of testing students just to make sure everything runs smoothly. And <laughs> so the first thing you need to do <clears throat> is um, write an SVM primal problem. So that's the good old optimization problem that we, are, that we know, right? The linear SVM, <laughs> you have to write this as a quadratic programming problem. And then you stick it into a quadratic programming solver. Right? There's one for Python, there's one for Julia. <clears throat> and you stick it in and then you run this and this is what you get, right? So basically we generate a data set that's linearly separable, a random one, and then the, if, if you did everything correctly, it should be able to classify this you know, uh, perfectly. Right, that's the first part of the homework assignment. You get 0% training error. Um, this here is the output of the this solver. So then we give you a data set here that is no longer linearly separable. Right, so this here is now, we have positive points and negative points, and clearly you can't separate them. And so the first thing you do is you run the code that you just wrote through this data set, and you will see that it won't work. Right? So this is what you get. Right? The, you know, well, you're setting this guy up for failure. It's a suicide mission, right? Uh, so he tries to find a hyperplane, doesn't work, right? <clears throat> so then you basically have to convert the primal problem to a dual problem. Now we give you the dual problem, right? So you don't have to do this. Um, as you have to define a kernel matrix, this here is a kernel matrix. What you see here is the ith and the jth input. And this here is the kernel value. Can anyone tell me why it looks like it has these funky, you know, Star Wars Rebel Alliance shape. <clears throat> Any idea? Because it's the spiral data, and so data points that are very close together are very similar, right? And so this here is actually, these are the training points, and this here are the testing points. So basically, um, the, the, they're kind of in order. So points that are close together are very similar. So if you compute the kernel, the RBF kernel, that's what it should look like, you know. This is a good, good way to debug it. So then here's the dual problem. And the question is, please implement this dual problem now as a quadratic program. So we have to figure out how to do this. I'm going to skip past it. Um, and the first thing you now do is to debug this to make sure your code is correct. You take the original data set that's linearly separable. You solve the dual problem with a linear kernel. Right? So if you do a linear kernel, you should again get out exactly the same linear classifier. And you run this, and this is what you get. Okay, so otherwise it's hard to debug a, you know, you know, a kernel that's actually solving some problems in elusive high dimensional space. But if you just use a linear kernel, the inner product is, you know, kij is just the inner product between two vectors, then you should get exactly the same result as before. Right? So this um, is a very effect effective way to debug your, your code. And then actually you, you, you run this and then this is what you get once you kernelize it, right? Uh, then actually the classifier can do the spiral thing very, very effectively. Uh, uh, and I think that's the last thing. There may still be a final competition where you actually are asked to run a, a, a cross-validation where you basically try to optimize for the different hyperparameters and try to find this matrix here tells you you have one parameter and the other parameter. Which one gives you lowest error? You basically try out different hyperparameters of your algorithm and um, so here red means high error, blue means low error. This is a way to find the right settings for your SVM algorithm. All right, see you all on Wednesday. <laughs>